Thank you. Well, um, this is a huge honor for me. Um, and I'm nervous because uh, there, um, there, there are few people I admire as well. Actually, I should tell you, um, you know, New York Times rules do not allow columnists to make explicit endorsements. Um, so you have no idea uh, which party I favor uh, politically. <laughs> um, and um, it, my attitude towards my honored guest here is, uh, well, I actually wrote, you may have seen a column that was titled, Who's Afraid of Nancy Pelosi? Um, that had the, uh, the, the blurb, um, the GOP's boogie woman is the greatest speaker of modern times. No. So if you have no idea whether I have any respect. <laughs> Um, so welcome, welcome leader Pelosi, um, it's, it's a huge honor, um, there's so much, I, I think everyone wants to talk about, you know, everyone wants to talk about what's going to happen next month, but, but I, okay, let's, 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 let's talk history just for a bit to start with, because uh, you had four years uh, so far, we'll see what comes, but four years as speaker, which were incredibly eventful, productive. What would you consider the, your big achievements of, of those years? Well, thank you, Dr. Coleman. You call me Nancy, I'll call you Paul. So All right, just I'm not sure I can bring myself to do that, I'll try. Okay, but, well, let me first say what an honor it is to be back at the 92nd Street Y, to thank Susan Adler, uh, Engel, Susan Engel for her leadership and her hospitality to all of us this evening. Thank you, Susan, for your... Yeah, thanks. And uh, what an honor it is to be with each and every one of you, and I know you share uh, the honor that we all feel to be with Dr. Krogman. He is, uh, well, how many times have we been on a Sunday night with a Nobel Prize winner in economics yeah. and a person who on a regular basis, uh, several days a week, uh, gives us hope. Uh, he, he speaks from evidence that's refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and when he writes, people read. When he speaks, people listen. What it, what it really, I'm, I, I should be the nervous one, but I'm so in awe of him that I'm just gonna have a good time tonight in this dark room so I can not see too much of what's going on out there, uh, but very eager to hear your questions. Okay, so I think that our crowning achievement of that time was the Affordable Care Act. I think it ranked... It ranked right up there with Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act, moving us uh, closer uh, to affordable, accessible, quality care, health care for all Americans. And that is our goal, to keep moving in that direction. It was something that had been tried for 100 years, starting with the Republican president, Teddy Roosevelt, over time. Uh, some advances were made with Medicare and Medicaid. I just was with Lucy Baines Johnson. She was telling me of the day that her father went to Independence, Missouri to sign Medicare and Medicaid with President Truman, for whom it was a, a very top priority. But now we went beyond that, and in the Affordable Care Act, with the expansion of Medicaid and the shoring up of the uh, uh, solvency of Medicare, just strengthening uh, the path that we were on. So I consider that without any question because it addresses the financial instability of America's families. It's an economic issue, financial issue for them, as whether, well, of course, a health issue. And I want to say that the Republicans tried very hard over and over, scores of, of attempts to undermine it when President Obama was president, but when, and they had the majority, but we were able to st sustain any veto that might be necessary. And then when they, um, uh, uh, when President... <laughs> yep. All right. Now, I'm going to be very respectful. <laughs> when President Trump took office, they um, then tried to repeal it. And they've harmed it, but they have not repealed it. And you know why? Because of the American people. American people, 10,000 events Paul, were held around the country by the groups, uh, the little lobbyists, the children coming in their uh, wheelchairs with pre-existing conditions to fight what they were trying to do, and especially when they passed their tax scam, uh, which, uh, which repealed the individual mandate, which gave them what they thought to be their 
rationalization anyway, to uh, repeal the pre-existing condition benefit. Uh, people have been outraged by that. But 10,000 events, sit-ins, district offices in the uh, capital of the United States, at the uh, town hall meetings, press conferences, every kind of venue, 10,000. So I feel very um, confident that we will be able to contain the damage and then hopefully win and uh, strengthen the Affordable Care Act. Do some changes that we would have done ourselves, you know, with time going by, but also to uh, erase some of the damage that they, that they did. I mean, this is, uh, uh, Martin Luther King said, of all the inequalities and injustices, the one about injustice of healthcare is the most uh, unconscionable because people can die. People can die. And so in any event, we consider that not an issue, but a, an ethic, a, mor a moral responsibility. So I'm going to ask, let me get, give, give a little voice to my inner nerd here. Um, the, uh, the thing that has been really impressive about the ACA is that it, um, I mean, I, you famously, infamously, totally out of context have been quoted, we would have to pass it for people to see what was in it, by which you meant that, that people wouldn't really appreciate it until it was in Well, but should we saw what the Senate would do. That was yes. before the Senate acted, too. That's right. But the, uh, but the point is now is it has, I, I don't think I fully appreciated just how cleverly it was put together so as to be robust to sabotage. Uh, we've seen that, that all of these, uh, d despite everything that the administration that wants it to fail has thrown at it, um, that, that it's still standing a little bit damaged, but not nearly as much as some feared. And I'm just curious about the process. How did, how did such a technically smart, you know, given, given, uh, given with the way what we see about policymaking, and uh, um, especially now, but just in general, uh, you know, it's, it's generally speaking worse than you can possibly imagine. But here's this really intelligent, well-designed, how did that happen? What was the interaction between the political people and the policy experts? How did that, how'd you make that work? Well, something that you base your writings on all the time, evidence, yeah. science, facts, truth. Uh, so we evaluated what the challenge would be. And this is, again, a challenge that had been undertaken decade after decade after decade. And uh, in our house, I'll just speak to our house, it was about the committees, the three committees of jurisdiction, ways and means, the funding of, uh, piece of it, the uh, uh, education and what we called labor, which we will call that again, labor committee, uh, which had the, uh, a, a piece of the jurisdiction, and the energy and commerce committee, despite its name, healthcare, is a part of its jurisdiction as well. And so the expertise that we had there, Henry Waxman as chairman, uh, uh, for a part, Charlie Rangel, and then Carl, um, uh, Chairman Levin after him, and then uh, George Miller on education and labor, they, their staffs really, and they, really knew the territory. The intellectual resource that was in the White House with President Obama was a tremendous resource, as well as, of course, the leadership and the rest in the Senate. So it was a question of how do, what is the goal? It, you know, it was a funny thing when we tried to talk about what do we call this, the word that meant everything to all of us was affordable. So while it, it, Medicare is probably the best name for any right. program, for care, but since that was taken, uh, the affordable <laughs> ACA, the Affordable Care Act, because that was the point of it. If it's not affordable, it's not accessible, and that was our goal. And so we had uh, great intellectual resources to uh, advance initiatives, but also competing initiatives. I myself would have liked to have had a public option in there. Right. We had it in the House. We couldn't prevail uh, in the full, full Congress, so, uh, so there were some uh, the things we didn't, we didn't get, uh, and, and there's some things we know that we have to do. But it was based on knowledge, and at one point, someone told me who was in a position to know and who had sway in the administration that the House bill is as close to a perfect bill as yeah. you can come, which is an no bills are perfect, or even close. But it really s saw its purpose, uh, it met its needs, but then you go through the whole process. The Senate was a valuable resource. Don't, get, don't let me diminish that at all. But, uh, but on the uh, 
if you want to say on the political side, we knew we had to, you can have all the commitment, all the conviction, all the knowledge, all the judgment, but it's a question of who has the courage. Who's going to be able to go out and vote for this bill right. in light of the fact that there was an enormously well-funded campaign to undermine it from the start? Big moneyed interest, interests that do not believe in a public role. They didn't believe in Medicare. Some of them still say Medicare should wither on the vine, and those people are in the Congress of the United States on the other side of the aisle. But big money undermining it. And uh, and it was about that courage. So I'll just tell you this story because you asked a specific question. When um, events did not go the way we wanted them to go in Massachusetts, you remember, uh, after the passing of uh, Senator Kennedy, by the way, in life and beyond, Senator Kennedy was a major force in this legislation, let me say. He had been trying to do this for a very right. long time. But anyway, when he, when he passed and then well, a Republican won in Massachusetts. I don't know how much politics we can talk here, but we'll see. Well, you invited me, so you know something's going to yeah, be political. That's right. But anyway, here's the thing. So the press said to me, what are you going to do now? You've lost that vote. I said, this, we consider this the responsibility of a generation. We will not let anything stand in the way of our passing the Affordable Care Act. If there's a fence, we will go up and push open the gate. If that doesn't work, we'll climb the fence. If, there's, if that doesn't work, we'll pull vault in, and if that doesn't work, we'll helicopter in. But we are not letting anything stand in the way of expanding affordable, quality health care accessible uh, to many, many millions more Americans. Okay, because they thought it was dead then, right? So then we pass the bill, and then they come and say, which one of these did you do? And, uh, and I said, actually, we pushed open the gate. Because it wasn't just us. It just wasn't the requisite number of Democrats in the House and Senate pushing open that gate. It was people all over the country who understood what this meant in their lives. It was uh, people from the March of Dimes or any of the... Uh, a group's advocacy groups, whether it's cancer, this, that, the other thing, just understanding that we had to pass this. It was the nuns. Thank God for the nuns to trump the bishops. But anyway. <laughs> there we go. I can say that as a Catholic. I went to Mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral today, so I can say that. The nuns to trump the bishops. And uh, because there were certain misrepresentations about what it meant for a woman's right to choose, and we were not going to have a bill that would um, diminish a woman's right to choose. So in any event, uh, it was inside maneuvering, knowledge of the issue, um, understanding of the, what it takes for some people to vote for something, yeah. and the outside mobilization, which was absolutely essential. And that's that same outside mobilization which has saved the Affordable Care Act as we go along. Is there something you, I think it's really two questions. Uh, I, I know that there are things you wish you could have had in the legislation. Is there something you think you could have gotten that, that, um, that if you had it to do over again, you would have? Oh, what I do now? I think that uh, one of the things that would be important now to do, as we see, uh, yeah. when, you, when you pass a bill, uh, you can't see every ramification. And as you see it, we, um, I would have put at a higher percentage of poverty the level at which people could get subsidies. Okay. Uh, because there is this place between people on Medicare, Medicaid, well, Medicare, of course, but let, let's talk about uh, the rest of the population. People on Medicaid, and we had the expansion of Medicaid, which some governors and state legislatures did not accept, which was really to the harmful, harmful, uh, uh, to the disadvantage of their own constituents. That's very sad. As an aside, in this election, we accepted when much, many more uh, Democratic governors and state legislatures to move many more people onto the expansion of Medicaid. Okay, so we have Medicaid, and people are on that. And then you had the, um, 
subsidies for a certain percentage of poverty, I would have gone higher. I mean, I'm not, we, we did what we could, but now I would say there's a gap between, there's just this gap among people who are just at that place that we can just yeah. raise the percentage as to where people would get the subsidies. And that is the, the beauty of the bill. As you see, that no matter what they do to it, those subsidies keep on coming. Yeah, I was gonna say that the, uh, for the audience, the, the way that the ACA is set up, the, um, as long as you are below 400% of the poverty line, um, there, it's a sliding scale, but premium payments are limited to a maximum share of your income. Um, and what that has meant is that for everybody below that, which is about 80%, I guess, of the people who are covered, um, whatever they do, they can sabotage the markets, the premiums go up, it doesn't actually affect what people pay. But there is that other 20% who are not people who are super rich, they're just people who are just a little bit too high, and those are the people who've been exposed to the premium increases. But it's an amazing, this is why it hasn't had a death spiral, despite right. everything Trump has been able to do. It's uh, because that structure of those subsidies. Was there a person who said, let's structure the subsidies, this will protect us against the death spiral, or was it just sort of emerged? Emer no, 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 well, the subsidies were, I mean, you, you know the subject very well. Uh, when you're looking at how you're going to expand uh, maintaining uh, the uh, fact that many people uh, receive their benefits from their employer, you know, recognizing what the reality. So it's not a tabula rasa where you say, okay, we're a new country, how would we do it? Would we do single payer? Would we do public option? Would we do no, it's a system that has a place where some people have a comfort level with how they get uh, their insurance, respecting that, their coverage, respecting that. Uh, we knew that subsidies had to be central right. to the legislation for it to be affordable, affordable, that is the, you know, the, yeah. the, the structure of them is just, is just turns out to be extremely clever. Right? It is, and I, I, I compliment all of the people who worked on it and all of the people who, who voted for it as well. Okay, let me ask you what I think is a less happy, I, but maybe you'll disagree with me on this. Um, one of the other really big achievements was financial reform. Yes. And my sense is that that's been, uh, more sabotage is doing more damage there. Would you agree? And what, how, how are you feeling about financial reform now, how that's playing out? Because we had Dodd-Frank, which was, again, a, a very intelligent bill, but it's, it's, uh, I don't think it was designed to be robust to having people like uh, uh, Mulvaney uh, running the system. So how, how are you feeling about it? Well, on the finan uh, financial service, the bill, uh, you have to put it in the context of what happened in 2008 which many people are still scarred from in terms of their homes going underwater, their, uh, their pensions being in doubt, living off their savings, their jobs in jeopardy, the question of whether they can send their children to school, to, to college, all in doubt and question uh, because of what happened there. Uh, and it was uh, really the result of a laissez, 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 laissez fair attitude on the part uh, of, the, of the Bush administration. The, um, the late, I don't even think Adam Smith would have been as irresponsible as they were. You know, there's, he, there's actually a part, of, there's a piece of The Wealth of Nations where he talks about the need to regulate banks. But he does, and then he wrote another book about our responsibilities to each other, really as yeah. a pragmatic matter, but nonetheless based on principles. And I wish he had just written one book and put yeah. them both uh, together. But in any event, this, this just, no intervention, no matter what, no supervision, no regulation, no nothing, and it took us to the brink. If, if I have a moment, I'd like to tell you a story. Sure. Okay, so we're in our office, I'm in my office, uh, and this is uh, September, what, 18th, 2008, and I, I, I'm there with the leadership, the Democratic leadership in the Speaker's office, and I said to them, you know, usually the Secretary of the Treasury comes and Gives, us a, gives me a briefing on the markets on a regular basis. I haven't seen them in a few weeks, and at that time it was Lehman, Merrill Lynch, and that very day, or the day before, the, but we were finding out about it that day, uh, AIG. So I'm gonna call him and ask him if he'll come and brief not just me, but all of us, so that we don't say anything that would undermine the confidence of the markets. 
right. as long as we you know, know what's going on. So I call them. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I think it's a little rude to say, can you come 9 o'clock tomorrow morning to brief uh, the leadership? And he says, uh, this is how you talk to each other. Mr. Secretary, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Madam Speaker, tomorrow morning will be too late. So I said, well, why am I calling you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why are you not calling me? Now, he has a kind of a different little nuance on this, but he said back to me, the White House did not want the Congress to know. So I said, well, what is it? You know, what, you know, how, it? One of the banks, I named one, which I won't name here, is it going down? He said, no, worse than another. Never. It's a complete meltdown. Complete meltdown. So I said, well, we'll make it 5 o'clock today. I called ben, uh, Chairman Bernanke. Mr. Chairman, blah, blah, 5 o'clock would be there. The White House finds out, and they say, who does she think she is having this meeting? So I said, tell them she thinks she is the Speaker of the House of Representatives. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have the meeting. It's expanded. It's later. It's 7. It's uh, Mitch McConnell. It's the House and Senate, Democratic and Republican leadership, plus Dodd, Frank, Shelby, you know, right. uh, uh, Baucus, who is the Republican. Uh, a little bit expanded meeting. Uh, Chairman Bernanke, Secretary Paul said, oh, by the way, for whom I have the greatest respect, and uh, Chris Cox, who was our former colleague, who was head of the SEC at the time, they brought him. Okay. So anyway, we have the meeting. Secretary Paulson describes this meltdown. It was going down to the gates of hell to a place that Dante would never have imagined, nor did he ever name. It was so horrible. So I say to the chairman, Mr. Chairman Bernanke, um, what do you have to say about what the secretary had to say? And he said, if we do not act immediately, we will not have an economy by Monday. An economy, no commercial paper, no nothing. By Monday, now it's Thursday night. Not five o'clock, but seven o'clock. Now it's even later. So of course we said we have to act in, um, in a bipartisan way, time is of the essence, no question. We go out, we say we're going to do it, this, that. Every, about every 15 minutes during the meeting, Harry uh, Leader Reed would say, um, how much is this going to cost? A hundred billion dollars? No, 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 no. 15 minutes, later, 200, but no, 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 no. 300, no, 400. He said, you're getting warmer. I said, that's how I talk to my grandchildren. That's not how we talk to the leader of the Senate. <laughs> How much is this going to cost? Oh, we'll let you know in a few hours. Well, it turned out $700 billion. Now, $350 billion is what we send on the, we're spending on the domestic discretionary budget. That means no defense and no um, Social Security, Medicare, et cetera. On the discretionary domestic budget, everything that the federal government does. This was two years' worth that we're going to give the banks in order to have this right. uh, default, uh, this uh, bailout. And so we said, well, this is what we have to do. This is what we have to do. I'll produce 120 votes since I have the majority. President Bush, you produce 100 votes. Of course, we never, to this day, we have never seen 100 votes. But on the first vote, you saw the market going down and the bill going down because they didn't even come through. And after it, they said, why would you expect us to vote for an intervention? We don't believe in an intervention. That's the Republicans, amazing story. We do not believe in an intervention. We then got more votes, and then uh, they produced a few more, but we had to pass the bill, which I do think was largely responsible for the election of 2010 because it was supposed to be even, Democrats and Republicans taking responsibility, but it turned out Democrats, because the Republicans did not believe in an intervention, even then when the walls were coming tumbling down. So in any event, just one as an aside, you might be interested to know, in the course of the night meeting, we said, how about if we have, in a bipartisan way, how, come if, how, how about if we put in the bill that you can capitalize the banks? This is more on the subject you ever want to know. Don't listen. Capitalize the bank. No, no, we would never need to do that because we have our break the glass plan. We've tested every model. This is our plan. We're going to... Um, by the toxic assets of these oh. institutions. Is toxic asset one of the worst oxymorons you've ever heard? Yeah. Oxymoron. 
toxic asset. We're going to buy the toxic asset. Well, I said, well, if that's such a good plan, why haven't you done it already? We were saving it for the next president. So you can just imagine, they were probably sitting there thinking, we just have to hold out two more months, or it's seven more weeks. The election will happen, the walls come tumbling down, we have a Democratic sure. president, that's probably why it happened, right? But any of it, not to question their motivation, they didn't do it. <laughs> anyway, we passed the bill. I said to them, I'm not going to require, prescribe that you capitalize the banks. I'm not even going to say that you have to do it with 50% of the money, but I'm going to give you the authority in the bill to capitalize the banks. Like three weeks later, they capitalized the banks. Yeah. After we then eventually passed the bill, then they capitalized the bank. So people were scarred by all of that. So therefore, we passed Dodd-Frank with the uh, Volcker rule, which is very important in terms of uh, the, the stability of the banks and the rest. And um, now when the Republicans came in, they were trying all during the uh, Obama administration when they had the majority, but now with uh, White House and uh, House and Senate, uh, they have chipped away at it in a major way. And we just have to make sure the public understands this is about their own financial security. You cannot, it's amazing that they would want to go right back to the situation that got us in the fix in the first place and the taxpayer bailed out, although we got all of our money back with interest because that's the way we wrote it in the bill. Uh, and um, uh, uh, Secretary Paulson was uh, very much in favor of that. But we can't let them do this. And I have expressed my displeasure even with the Fed for weakening, in my view, the Volcker rule. They don't think they did. They said it's a question of interpretation. They don't think they did. But I don't know what the next step is, even at the Fed. Uh, and I'm a big believer in the independence of the Fed. Uh, but I think we have to make sure that the intent of Congress is very clear, and we may have to do that again. OK, that's an amazing story. and. Uh, is there more on the subject than you ever wanted to know? <laughs> this is something of a rhetorical question. What do you, what, how, how well do you think the current crew would manage it if something like this happened again? I'm sorry? How do you think uh, the current management would, would deal with it if something like that happened again? Because see, there's no Henry Paulson in this, one, in this administration. <laughs> sorry, okay. I, that wasn't really a question. Uh, uh, oh, that's scary. That really okay. is scary. Okay, I'm going to... Um... And by the way, President, Bo President Bush was very, trying very hard to get the Republicans to vote for this. He knew it. Would, he said, of course they'll vote for it. Yeah. Of course they'll vote for it. <sighs> yes. Uh, one of those, President Bush looks better in hindsight, <laughs> although probably too good in hindsight. But anyway... Um... Well, the president that I quote the most in the campaign is Ronald Reagan. Would you have ever guessed that? If you ask me, I'll tell you why. Well, that, I, what, tell, tell me. <laughs> let's, let's, let's hear it. That's what we can't, can't not. Well, the reason I quote President Reagan is because as I go across the country, I see with great heartbreak, but reality, uh, what the current president and the Republicans in the Congress and really Republicans across the country, 80% of them support what President Trump is doing on immigration. And it's heartbreaking to see the ads on TV that it, it, I, don't, I don't even go into, you, you know. So, I mean, they're snatching babies out of the arms of their mothers, they're depriving dreamers of an opportunity, but that's, that's the visible part of it. What they're doing in these ads on TV are just terrible. But in any event, why I'll quote Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan, he said this, this is the last speech I will make as President of the United States. How's that for a headline? Last speech. And I want to deliver a message to the country I love. He goes on to talk about the Statue of Liberty and what it means to people outside our country when they see that beacon of hope and that uh, symbol of welcome to America to achieve the American dream and what it means to Americans who look and see the Statue of Liberty and think my parents, my grandparents, my ancestors came past that to the American dream. Then he goes on to say, the vital, I'm not exactly, I'm trying to 
be brief. The vital force of America's preeminence in the world is every generation of new immigrants coming to America. And once, <laughs> and once we fail to recognize that, we will fail to be preeminent in the world. Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Ronald Reagan. Yeah. And, and he, he um, Ronald Reagan, George Herbert Walker Bush, I should say President Ronald Reagan, President George Herbert Walker, President Bill Clinton, President George Bush, George W. Bush, great on immigration, he couldn't persuade his party, but, and President Barack Obama all understood that when newcomers come to our country with their hope, their optimism, their determination to make the future better for their families, their courage, those are American traits, and the newcomers make America more American. They constantly revitalize our country until now. That's why I quote Ronald Reagan. Isn't it beautiful? Go look it up because it's longer and better than even I said. <laughs> okay. Um, wow, time is flying. Um, you had this amazing, eventful four years as speaker, and you first showed up on the cover of Time magazine last month. <laughs> Uh, what does that say? Uh, what does it say about uh, obviously to about politics, but also about um, what does that say to the women of America? It's it's not exactly that I wasn't on the cover. It's who was on the cover. Oh. <laughs> uh, some people just had well. In any event, you would have thought that. See, the, most people really don't know what being speaker is. President. Vice President, Speaker of the House. President Bush used to call me number three. I'm one, he's two, pointing to Cheney, you're three. So he understood. It's a, a constitutional office with succession to the presidency. It's a very big deal. But forgetting the succession, the Speaker has awesome power. And we were able to do so many things, trying to do it in the most open way. You asked about how we did the Affordable Care Act hundreds of hours of open hearings, accepting Democratic and Republican amendments, refusing some on both sides of the aisle. So, so it, it, it's, it's a very important position, and maybe they just didn't realize that. However, I will say that, that it is challenging. I, mean, I, I always thought it would be easier to elect a woman president of the United States than a leader in the Congress, because that is not breaking the grass, glass ceiling in Congress, it's breaking the marble ceiling. There's oh, great. hundreds of years of pecking order. Who's next, who's next, who's next, who's next, never mind. They said, it's not your turn. I said, we've been waiting over 200 years. It is our turn. <laughs> but, but this is a great year. This is a tipping point. This is a watershed year uh, for women uh, because so many women will win and they will be a part of the great uh, democratic victory, God willing. If the election were today, we would have a democratic Congress. I feel certain of that. And, and I say to women, and I, I had these meetings in uh, Pennsylvania, because we're going to elect four women to the Congress. They, they've only had one woman in the whole history, over 200 years of history in Pennsylvania, one woman serve in the Congress of the United wow. States. Now they will have four in one, in one election. Oh, no, they've had two. They've had, I think they've had one or two, but in any event, they'll have four in one election. So we have, uh, I just say to young women, or women, but young into politics. I, I, after my five children were grown, I, um, I ran for Congress. So I want younger women to run so that people with family balancing home and work are um, seeing someone who shares their challenges, et cetera making decisions on their behalf in Washington. But I say to women, know your power, know your purpose. Why do you want to run? Know your subject, know how you're going to get it done. Connect, listen to your constituents, just connect. It, connection is everything. You can have the best ideas and vision and all, plans and all the rest. If you don't connect, that's not a, a winning formula for an election. But know your power. And I know this as an absolute fact. You may think some of the things I've said are opinion. This is an absolute fact. 
If we reduce the role of money in politics and increase the level of civility in politics, we will elect many more women, minorities, young people, and the rest to the Congress of the United States. And nothing is more wholesome to our political system and our governance than the increased participation of women and women in the leadership. Now that applies the military, to corporate America, to the academic world. It applies all over, but it is absolutely essential. And this year will make a tremendous difference. But there's no question, there, there is something out there that is perhaps unspoken, in my case, very spoken. I'm the biggest target, right? It's, it's, <laughs> they come after me. Yeah. And I say they just do because I'm so effective. I'm an effective legislator. I'm an effective political force and the rest. And I say that with immodesty because you know why? I want young women and women who want to be involved in politics to be confident and just put forth why they think. Because none of us is indispensable, but we have to show why we think we can do the job uh, in a very important way. And it's very important to have women at the table. Okay. We, I just proved that I'm really in, unsuited for anything like the work you've done because my time budgeting has been terrible here. Oh. Um, but the, um, oh. let me ask question. Um, oh, that's the time. I thought that the was time. the minutes we had left. No, but we're, uh, <laughs> we want to throw this off to the audience pretty soon. But let me ask, um, so I, let me skip. Uh, imagine uh, that... It's, uh, it's, it's January 2021, and uh, the Democrats control uh, both houses, and President, I don't know, Michael Avenatti. Uh, <laughs> I, I checked, Taylor Swift will be too young. Um, so, but anyway, a Democratic president, a uh, progressive Democratic president, what, what would be at the top of your agenda to do at that point? What will Democrats' agenda, whether it's you or someone else? But Well, I've, I have an agenda right now for 2019. Sure. I just take this enough. one uh, Congress at a time. And I do believe when we go in now, we have said, what are Democrats for? We are for the people, for lowering health care costs by reducing the price of prescription drugs. That's one. Two, by lift, increasing paychecks by building the infrastructure uh, of America, lower cost bigger paychecks, cleaner government. Uh, just, I think it will be, but it's up to the caucus. The first uh, HR1, House Resolution 1, will be campaign finance reform and legislation that relates to that. Um, and so that would be, uh, that would be uh, the three things that we, we think we could do in a bipartisan way because the president says he's for reducing the cost of prescription drugs. He said he was going to negotiate like crazy for them. I think like crazy meant not at all. But <laughs> no, but the day he made his announcement on prescription drugs, he completely pulled his punch. And don't take it from me, take it from the stock market. The pharma stocks went through the roof yeah. because the president pulled his punch. So, but anyway, we think we could, in a bipartisan, in a, uh, uh, infrastructure has always been nonpartisan, so we think we could pass that. And we think with public opinion, we could pass uh, the campaign finance reform. But the public, President Lincoln, another Republican president, that makes two, well, uh, they, um, they, um, he said public sentiment is everything. With it, you can accomplish almost anything without it practically nothing. And so we think with public opinion of that the uh, idea that people's voices are just as strong as, any, as anyone else's and that special interests do not override the public interest. So that would be three. And then we prompt, we ask the speaker for common sense uh, legislation for uh, sensible background checks. And we know there's bipartisan support for that. So that is something that we would do In early. In case people missed that, background checks for gun purchases. For gun purchases. Oh, yes. So gun safety background checks. This is very, very important uh, in our country. And we're just not ever stopping until we get uh, increase that safety issue in our country. We have, it has bipartisan support in the Congress now. If they gave us a vote, I think we would win. Uh, but we certainly asked the speaker to do it. He didn't. Maybe he will in a lame duck. I hope so. Every day counts. But 
uh, we would have uh, a gun violence prevention background check bill that would pass the, the House of Representatives. And the other thing that we've asked him for is legislation to protect the dreamers. And we, that's something that we should be able to do in a bipartisan way, very quickly. The bigger issue of comprehensive immigration reform, I think, would have bipartisan support, but I'm just talking about right up front. Right. Another issue on our agenda is something called the Equality Act, which is about equality for the LGBTQ community in our country. It's a, a, we, it makes a protections for the community part of the Civil Rights Act. Right now, it's women, minorities, et cetera. It adds uh, uh, that important uh, participant community uh, to the... Okay, I'm... I'm and that's uh, David Cicilline's bill. That, so that's six, for starters. All right. Um, I'm supposed to, but I, I'm going to throw in one more question, and I believe I'm going to be getting questions from the audience passed up here, I think. Um, but it, it, this, so forgive me, and I, we didn't talk about that, but I, I asked your staff if it was okay to ask this. And I, um, friends of mine want to know, do you decompress, and if so, what do you do? This, it's, a per, it's a personal, just, right. just this amazing person and all these things, but you seem to be the completely nonstop, what do you do um, uh, to, to get away from it for an hour or two? After I read your column? Oh, uh, well. <laughs> That's yeah. the most refreshing Don't thing think. of all. Uh, I, uh, well, of course, my family, my five children, my, my grandchildren, the rest, that's the strength for all of us, we would all say. It's our motivation, it's our relaxation, it's our pleasure, uh, it's our, our challenge to make sure uh, we uh, do the right thing by all of that. So that's, that's a source of strength to me. For my whole life, I mean, let me just say, I don't, let me say my adult life. Every single day, I have done the New York Times crossword puzzle. All right. <laughs> and that is it. I mean, like, on a Sunday, don't come near me until I do the puzzle, because I'm timing myself, and I'm in a zone, and I'm focusing on it, and my family will tell you, oh my gosh, she's doing the puzzle. If anybody comes near me, it's like, <gasps> I'm in my zone. <laughs> so that is a real um, a dis uh, pleasure for me. Yeah. All right, that's, uh, that's a... Oh, okay. and of course, I read books, and I go, but I'm just talking about it every single day. All right, okay, I'm, I'm going to... Um... Even when they write terrible articles about me. Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, uh, even I don't necessarily enjoy everything I see in, in my paper. Uh, so, oh, wow. Um, all right, let me, let me throw these. Uh, I have some questions for you. Oh, that's not, that was not the agenda here. Oh, but don't you have some questions for Paul? I mean, no, really. no, no. I've, I've done these events and. Uh, You'll, and we want people to leave here hopeful. And I'm trying to tell them we're going to win this election if we own the ground. If we own the ground, we don't agonize. I've told some of you earlier, we don't agonize, we organize. We get out there and organize. My three grandchildren who are here tonight hear me say that all the time. It's all about the future. It's all about our children and, and how we prepare for the future. So, uh, so uh, no. perhaps you have some I, words I'm not, for us. Uh, so. No, I'm not, I'm not going to... Uh, we'll read about it. You'll read about it. Okay. I, God knows. That, uh, um, so, these are... We're not going to get through anywhere in, uh, through these things either. Let me ask... Uh, so that this, ask what, them all, and I'll answer them all at once. Right. <laughs> uh, you, you're probably organized enough in your mind to do that. But let, let me ask... Uh, this, this actually seems quite urgent. Um, when the Democrats win back the House, um, if Republicans control the Senate... Um, you know, if you believe the polling, that split outcome looks like a reasonably plausible um, thing. Um, what can the House do to protect the independence of the Mueller investigation? That's a big, oh, that's a serious question. That's a very serious question. What we have been trying all along to have bipartisan support for legislation that would say uh, that, that uh, any council, I'm not talking about just this council, any council cannot be fired without cause, and then if the person is fired, then there'd be a three judge, an appeal process to review if that cause was justified, and that any replacement could not be made by anybody um, that was not approved 
uh, by, by the Senate. But, but anyway, it has protections in it. But most important, to preserve the documentation, to preserve everything that he has collected. Okay. Because that is, that is essential. Some people are concerned that they might destroy some of the, those documents, and we have to make sure they don't. But um, I'm still hopeful about the United States Senate. Chuck Schumer's doing a fabulous job keeping us all focused on health care, health care, health care, while other people are trying to, uh, the, on the other side, are trying to exploit uh, the disgraceful performance of the Republicans in the Senate on, on um, the Supreme Court nomination. It was a disgrace, but they're selling it as a plus uh, to their market. But we have to not talk about that. We have to talk about health care, lower cost, bigger paychecks, cleaner government. And I think that uh, it's three and a half weeks away. It's a long time. Yeah. I, okay. Um, By the way, I have just, don't tell anybody I told you this. Right. You okay with that? Yeah. I have asked for a Freedom of Information Act on all the things that happened with the Supreme Court. What, what was the... What is the um, investigation? What were the instructions the FBI received? Things like that, so that we have that documentation. Not that we're going after the judge, but we're, we don't want this to happen again. And we want to see. We want to see how could they have a report? And then they're like they're going to the bathroom one at a time for a certain time, a period of time, and you can't talk to your staff. Their staff can't say it's really really an insult to the intelligence of American people, uh, a besmirchment of the Supreme Court of the United States, an assault to all women who speak their truth. So actually this... Mm -hmm. um, this seems relevant given what you just said. Uh, has Mitch McConnell permanently broken congressional norms and I, I suspect you won't go for this formulation of it, but should Democrats get even when they take back power in January? Well, I'm not a, I'm not a subscriber to the Pound of Flesh Club, which we do have in our caucus and in our party. <clears throat> I do think that this election is bigger than Democrats and Republicans. This is about the United States of America. Uh, so much is at stake. Uh, these people with this nomination even uh, are undermining the oath of office they take to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. Our founders, in their wisdom, had a Constitution that had three co-equal branches of government. What did they do? Be a rubber stamp. First Amendment, the, excuse me, the first article, Article One, the legislative branch, with all the powers listed in the Constitution. What did they make Article One, the legislative branch? A rubber stamp for the second branch of government, the executive branch. And by confirming an appointment to the Supreme Court who said the president, the executive branch, is above the law, undermining the whole thing. So I, I, um, I think that we have to, uh, as I said, we don't agonize, we organize for helping the American people. Because this justice will decide on the intent of Congress on certain legislation. Yeah. That's a ridiculous power to give the Supreme Court to determine what the intent of Congress is. And so if they're going to make a judgment on at what we do, we have to have total clarity about what we do when it comes to everything. A woman's right to choose. Okay, mar well, we didn't pass a marriage equality. That was in the courts, but hopefully that will be protected. But we passed other LGBTQ legislation, whether it re because, whether it's about immigration, whether it's about gun safety, whether it's about climate. We didn't even talk about climate. Uh, I was talking to Ed Markey when I was coming over here talking about wanting to establish, again, a select committee on climate and, and with the storms and the rest increased interest in it. And he said, remember that what we said was we wanted to uh, pass an overwhelming number of jobs in order to protect all of our, our society. I mean, this is, this is about prosperity. As your former mentor yes. won the Nobel Prize showing the relationship between environment and prosperity. 
for people who don't know, Bill Nordhaus, who, sh who shared the Nobel Prize and won it for his work on climate economics, uh, was my original uh, mentor. I, I worked, I was his research assistant when I was a junior in college, so anyway. So, yeah. He mentored well, didn't he? <laughs> anyway. your, your, your mentor mentored well. But, um, so this is... Um, the, the so anyway, I'm, I'm, I think that, that we owe the American people to be there for them, for, the, for their financial security, respecting the dignity and worth of every person in our country. And if there's some um, collateral damage, for some others who do not share our view, well, so be it, but it shouldn't be our original purpose. This is kind of related, and it, the question was if the House and Senate are split after the election, but I think this is a question even, even if they are not. Uh, uh, where do you see opportun opportunities for common ground? Is there any bipartisan stuff that you can know, I, I, I named some of them before in terms of uh, infrastructure, building the infrastructure of America, Imagine building infrastructure from sea to shining sea, whether it's uh, surface transportation, yeah, but water systems, broadband all over our country, schools, housing, all kinds of infrastructure that creates good bang jobs building, but also build the economy all the way. And when you build all of that across the country, care and feeding follows. Issues that relate to the health and well-being of people, the education of children, it's, it's, it's really a big uh, issue of prosperity and bigger paychecks for America. I think we can find common ground to do that. Okay. And so that infrastructure, you think, would be a big, a big one. And then I mentioned I do think there's common ground on, on uh, dreamers and guns and, and uh, hopefully also on lowering prescription drug prices and hopefully also on uh, campaign finance reform. Okay. I'm going to read you. This is... I'm, I'm not, okay, I'll, I'll read it to you. I'll, I'll say I don't fully agree with the premise of the question, but uh, the Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security currently account for over 50% of the federal budget. Uh, with rising health care costs and aging population, the cost of these programs is unsustainable. Um, how much of a priority is fixing this problem, and how would you do so? Well, I think it's a fair question because it is, uh, it is about, uh, obviously, the promise that is made uh, to people in our country and anything that involves that many people and their well-being and their trust in it, as well as the amount of money involved, uh, we need to subject uh, to scrutiny from time to time, as President Reagan and President and, and Speaker uh, Speaker O'Neill did. And uh, the if we are going to so, so you're referring to the, the Social Security reform that took place in, in uh, the, the Greenspan Commission, yeah. although yeah, he didn't really do it. But yes, okay. We don't Social Security was, was saved for, for I think he's many a lovely decades. person. We don't count it that way. But anyway, the, um, uh, so, and what we did in the Affordable Care Act was to prolong the solvency of Medicare. But if you, let me just uh, uh, separate from the specifics of the question in this way. If we are going to address the issue of the solvency of Social Security, of Medicare, and Medicaid, we have to do it believing in those systems, not using them as an excuse to say, well, we can't, we'll, we've got to give a big tax break to the high, this is what they did. Can you believe this? $2 trillion tax scam, $1.45 trillion in tax breaks to corporations, the top 1% getting 83% of the benefits. Top 1% of people in our country getting 83% of the benefits of the tax thing. Then they said, of course, with interest, this will be $2 trillion. Then they said, we've got to cut someplace. So the president put out his budget and said, $1.4 trillion out of Medicaid, half a trillion out of Medicare. Then he went on to food stamps and other things like that. So they, they, um, they can't consider it their ATM machine right. to, to rationalize tax cuts at the high end, which, by the way, they say pays for themselves. Never happens never happens. Don't take it from me. Uh, even those who've worked on the supply side economics, uh, that gospel, they have said to us, anyone who tells you these tax cuts pay for themselves, it's not true. It's nonsense. It's BS, spelled out fully. So, so, it, so in, in any event, 
are there things that we should always subject to scrutiny to see how we can do better, recognizing the reality of life, that there are many more people retiring, living longer, and fewer percentage of people in the workforce, but that doesn't mean, I mean, actually, these uh, trust funds have been a bulwark yeah. of funds at, at, in terms of, of, the, um, of the budget. But I do believe that what we do has to uh, strengthen the institutions and not be predicated on this. This is what the Republican view of Medicare is. It should wither on the vine. How do we do that? We, um, in the Speaker Ryan's budget that he put forth, and which is his goal, if, the, if, he, if, if he were to be there, or at least he wants the other Republicans to do it, is to take away the guarantee of Medicare and make it a voucher, voucherize it. When you don't have a guarantee, you ain't got no Medicare, because Medicare is a guarantee. And so he wants to voucherize that, block grant Medicaid, make it very hard uh, for people who defend. And by the way, on Medicaid, they're taking $1.4 trillion out of the president's budget, out of Medicaid in the president's budget. It is initially a program for poor children, and that's important. Many poor children depend on it. But probably about 60% of the money that is spent on long-term care for seniors is a middle-income benefit yeah. comes from Medicaid. So when people see what this means to their families, they have a different view about uh, whether we should use it as a piggy bank for tax cuts uh, for the rich and for corporations. And yeah, the one of the things that surprised me is that uh, Medicaid is surprisingly popular in polling. You know that I thought that you might have thought that people would think of it as a poor people's program, but that and they'd be against it. But they're not. It has almost as much support, according to the polling, as as Medicare. Uh, mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, which actually, I'm going to bring back one of my questions that I didn't get to ask because it seems relevant here. Um, it's been striking also that this, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, the Trump tax cut is not popular, no. it has remained. And that's, that has come as a surprise to those of us who remember the Bush tax cuts, which were also very heavily loaded towards upper income, mm -hmm. but, but were broadly quite popular because people looked at the little bit they got and they saw that and they did. So what do you think has made the difference this time? One of the things that they, well, first of all, this is really blatant. When you have a tax plan that says, well, we're gonna have some, uh, something, a little something for the middle class, but that's temporary, but we're gonna have permanent uh, for corporate America and the rest. That yeah. Already they said to the middle class, you're second class uh, to us. So that, th th there was so, so little, and, and when I get criticized for saying it was crumbs, I said it was crumbs from the ta banquet table that they were giving to other people. But here's the, Here's one thing, there, there's several different things. First of all, the nature of the bill. Dark of night, speed of light, no hearings, no possible figuring out what the ramifications are, no expert witnesses, nothing. They just go in a room, they write a bill, tax cuts for the high end for corporate America uh, with a benefit uh, uh, to send jobs overseas in the bill, yeah. a, an advantage to create jobs overseas rather than the US, a terrible bill, a scam. But anyway, in the bill, if it weren't bad enough, because the public generally gets used to the fact that the rich get richer, right? I mean, right? Then that's not a good thing. But nonetheless, no surprise to anybody that a tax bill written by Republicans for Republicans would, would benefit that way. Here's what they did in the bill. They repealed the individual mandate for health care and health care. Why that's important to each and every one of you in here if you know anybody in your family with a pre-existing medical condition. They used that provision of the bill as the basis for their court case to say that the pre-existing condition benefit is not constitutional. Yeah, if people don't know, again, there's a lawsuit brought by 20 Republican state attorneys general, attorneys general. to overturn the piece of the ACA central piece, which, which pro prohibits insurance companies from discriminating against people with pre-existing medical conditions. And that's 125 or 130 million families in our country which have somebody with a pre-existing medical condition. So this is horrible. And as I said earlier, all of the groups that represent 
different uh, cancer, diabetes, heart, you, know, you name it, they understand what this means. People with disabilities, children born with a heart defect, they have a pre-existing condition for the rest of their lives. And, and uh, some of the beauty of the Affordable Care Act were that we had this, uh, this provision that protected people with a pre-existing condition. We also removed the cap. So that means that you, you, once you reach a certain amount, the insurance companies can say, it's over for you. That can be for some people who are two years old if they have a number of, yeah. of uh, uh, procedures. And so it, it's a terrible thing. But anyway, they don't believe in a public role. And that's really what people have to understand. They do not believe in a public role. So Medicare should wither on the vine. Medicaid should be block grant. Pre-existing condition, forget about it. Uh, it just it, the list goes on and on. But um, uh, in that regard, what is the normal thing when a law, which this is, is, a, is um, um, challenged as this is being by those attorneys general? It is the role of the Justice Department to defend the law of the land. But this administration said, not only are we not going to defend it, we join in the consideration that that pre-existing condition benefit should go. It's probably one of the biggest things. Now, getting back to your question about why the tax bill is unpopular, the groups that save the Affordable Care Act, they're out there on this tax bill. Again, they care about the unfairness of it, but they care more about the fact of what it does to people with pre-existing conditions. And that is a big motivator. Oh, there are nuns on the bus now going all around the country, thank God for the nuns. But there are groups <laughs> all, oh, they're, they're beautiful uh, works are, are, are benefiting everyone. But, but all of these same groups are fighting this, and this is one of the biggest issues in the election, the cost of health care, whether it's the cost of prescription drugs, getting rid of the pre-existing condition, undermining Medicare and Medicaid, and the rising cost of some premiums because of, of uh, Trump, I don't care. I, I think he calls it Trump care, but I don't think he does. So in any case, the unpopularity not only goes to the unfairness of it, but to the fact of what it does to health care. Okay. And that, in terms of the outside mobilization, is... Now, there, we'd also have, following them around, they have a jobs joke kind of a thing about their tax bill that they're going around, but we're going around with them with a group, a uh, tax fairness group, about inoculating against their uh, terrible message, but also saying we can do better. We should go to the table in a bipartisan way. Should we reduce the corporate tax rate? Let's consider that. How low should it go, and how does that relate? But whatever we do with the, with the tax code, and whatever we do with the budget. See, the tax code relates directly to the budget. Budget should be a statement of our national values. What is important to us as a nation should be how we allocate our resources. And that means how we obtain uh, the resources as well. And uh, that, I don't think anything they're doing is a reflection of anybody's values except the special interest. But having said that, the um, uh, the, the groups know the impact on the budget opportunities, the opportunity cost of these uh, tax cuts. And that is why I think it's less popular uh, than what President um, uh, Bush did, as harmful as that was uh, to our budget. So we're really out of time, but I've got to give you the one last question. Uh, is it about politics? It is about politics. All right. Now we and it's, uh, <laughs> it's and I need to say, this is not my question because I probably am not allowed to ask this, but someone did ask. Uh, besides donations and phone banks, what is the most effective way that voters can ensure you become Speaker of the House again? Oh. <laughs> uh, besides what? Uh, besides besides um, donations, donations and phone banks. Okay, here's the thing. As I said earlier, so many of you have said to me, oh my goodness, don't agonize, organize. Channel that energy. We must own the ground. We must own the ground. And I listen to volunteers all over the country, and they tell me what they're hearing. And it's very, very uh, encouraging. People are excited. They're ready to vote, this or that. But you, you, until they do, 
we don't have a victory, we just have a vision. A vision without a plan is a fantasy. A vision with a plan is a victory. And so the plan is, all of you, just please volunteer or encourage others to do if you can, or even by phoning, because that is, that is what will make all the difference in the world, owning the ground. Every step I say to the volunteers, you are our VIPs, volunteers in politics. You will make the difference. The fate of the nation is riding on people, knocking on doors, making calls. And every step they take, every door they knock, every phone you make, every sign you plant, every postcard you send, send takes us closer uh, to taking our country to a better place, a place where when we win, we will have openness and transparency in how we run the Congress as we did before, but very different from the way it is now. We will have respect for bipartisanship. Some Democrats don't like me saying that, but where we can find common ground, we have a responsibility to seek it. Where we can't, as Jefferson said, stand like a rock. Stand like a rock where you can't find your common ground. And we will have honor the vows of our founders when they talked about e pluribus unum, from many one, from many one. They couldn't possibly imagine how many we would become or how different we would be from each other. But they knew that we had to be, had that oneness about the United States of America. This is, this is the greatest country that ever existed in the history of the world. And yet we have one in five children in America who lives in poverty in our country. That's my motivation uh, to be in politics. Whatever your why is, just get out there and, and own the ground. I do think at the election today we would win. I do not accept the fact that we are not going to win the Senate. Uh, I think we just have to keep working and the work we do to win the House will help with the Senate as well. But nothing less than the fate of the nation is riding. It's not about Democrats or Republicans. That would be the least of it. It's about how we honor the vows, the vision of our founders with the Constitution, with checks and balances, co-equal branches of government, how we honor the bravery and sacrifice of our men and women in uniform and their families to make us the, keep us the land of the free, the home of the brave, and how we just attend to the aspirations of our children. Our children, our children, our children. Elections are about the future and how we, win, how we conduct the election, how we conduct ourselves when we win uh, so that we can responsibly, again, uh, have our p children grow up in a country uh, that is uh, worthy of the, of the vision and sacrifice of those uh, who went before and the aspirations of those children. So if you can, just tell a friend, get out there. And if you live in a district that is highly democratic, call a friend who lives some other place or go visit them and have a buddy system and go door to door. I'm just telling you, if I just may say, these elections are very close. People ask me, is it a wave or is it a tsunami? I said, in either case, it's many drops of water. And these elections are that close. There are many close elections. Think of the Olympics. One second, gold, silver, bronze, happy to be an Olympian. <laughs> Within a second, we're going for the gold. We're going for the gold. And, and All right. So, you know. Thank you so much. What a fabulous time.